Hi and welcome to this very first podcast episode called Bonsai Seasons. And the reason for this is that uh, Bonsai Seasons uh, is close to my heart. It is uh, the name of the garden, Kisetsu N, means Garden of the Changing Seasons. It is partly a title of my new Shohin Bonsai book, Shohin Through the Seasons. And I just want to start this podcast by introducing myself in this very first episode. Some of you, of course, do not know me, others do know me. I have been on the bonsai scene for a lot of years, but in this very first episode, I would like to introduce myself and uh, tell you a little about how it all started for me. I was introduced to bonsai many years ago uh, by accident, actually. I'm originally an educated gardener uh, at a greenhouse producing uh, houseplants, ficus for homes, uh, things like that, and summer flowers for the gardens. A very commercial business and uh, not very exciting, if you ask me today, and I left that pretty early and became a photographer instead. I took some after education as a, a florist arranging flowers and I had a shop for a little while until I sold that in my very young days in the early 20s. But uh, at one of those days of uh, education at the Gartner School, there was a teacher who had some uh, introduction to bonsai and extra lection. I just thought it sounded interesting to take this free uh, evening class for a little fun and I have no, none whatsoever, no idea about what bonsai was at that time. And I was around uh, 19 or 20 years, something like that. I have never heard about bonsai before, so I th thought that sounds interesting. And uh, my destiny was sealed that evening. Uh, probably a not very exciting material was uh, transplanted. And uh, my teacher was uh, probably one of the very early starters of bonsai in my country, in Denmark. And I know that the Danish Bonsai Society was formed just a little later in 1984, and this was uh, four years earlier, something like that. Not important, but uh, just to set the history. I couldn't make bonsai for a long time because it demands you have a garden or something like that. I know a guy in Denmark who uh, have his bonsai on a balcony, but I thought that was not possible. At that time I didn't think in that direction. So that was my very first and brief introduction to bonsai, but I could, couldn't get it out of my mind. I went to a bookstore and bought a book about bonsai, read all about it without doing nothing. So it just stayed in the back of my head. And I just knew I had to do something with this sometime, someday. Years later, it was possible to, uh, to do some bonsai. I was stopped working as a commercial gardener and got my first own place and began to select some trees to work on. And uh, at that time, it was available at ordinary uh, garden centers. Uh, there were no bonsai shops that I knew of and I just started by buying cheap material and cutting some back and trying to start something from scratch and that has been my method ever since. I am starting things from raw material and growing my own bonsai uh, this way. Uh, you can of course buy pre-bonsai today and I have a few of them too but I really like the to travel with a tree starting from a very simple material into something beautiful. It takes a lot of time, of course. You need to be patient and then try to be. That also is the important lesson in bonsai, that you have to be patient and you have to adapt to the time it takes to develop bonsai. You cannot force anything. You can speed up a little some processes, but on the long run, it is the patience that pays off. In uh, very opposition to the environment I came from uh, as a professional gardener, where everything is about growing things at a speed, at a low cost as possible, and with young material. This is the opposite. You try to bring something old, or sometimes also trying to bring something young into being old, but you're working with age and time 
and timelessness, where in the industry of garden production uh, of uh, nursery material, everything is about speed. This way I was hooked to bonsai, although the first years I couldn't do anything because I didn't have a garden. Later when that was possible, and uh, that is around 30 years ago, I began to make my first mistakes with bonsai, searching for the limits of what you can do and uh, what you cannot do at what time. Of course, I have a great advantage of being a gardener, knowing the physiology and all of the methods to propagate and, and grow plants at a speed. But I didn't know about trees. And trees is very different from soft uh, shrubs and, and uh, ficus plants for housekeeping. It's a very different method and it is a very different travel. A tree is not made to be in a pot. You have a lot of things you have to think about when a pot is heated up in the soil and the roots are heated up, how to control the health of a tree and develop it uh, and let it stay healthy and survive yourself so somebody else will have the pleasure of it when you die. And it is as simple as that and that is one of the teachings you get from bonsai. You learn a lot about life, you learn a lot about yourself, uh, and you get a lot of friendships in the world of bonsai. I have been growing bonsai for 30 years now, and uh, I have learned a lot of this myself, soaking up everything I can at every time I can through books and magazines in earlier days, and later on when I was have been traveling around uh, with other professionals. You always learn something by watching them. And you have to have this humility around bonsai, about bonsai, that you are on a constant learning trip. And I find some new thing every week I, I either didn't know or a different direction or a different appreciations of uh, something in bonsai. It might just be details or it might be growing techniques someone have developed that where you think, okay, I didn't know that. And, and another thing you have to, to know about bonsai, at least what I have learned about bonsai, is that there is more than one solution. There's more than one way of doing the same things. What uh, I do not succeed with, another one will, and opposite. And uh, if you teach one technique, you can find uh, 10 other people teaching this a little bit different, and uh, everything could end up with the same result. Just follow the path you believe in and uh, what you succeed with yourself. There's not only one solution to everything. There can be several. That is one of the teaching lessons you learn through life uh, with bonsai. For more than 20 years, I also have been involved in a very small personal group of three people doing bonsai at a monthly basis, learning from each other. So bonsai teaches you a lot about uh, not just the art form, but about life this way. And uh, on my journey, I have uh, found an interest in a variety of bonsai. I have started out with uh, the small material, the Shohin bonsai, that many people know me from today, because I have written a lot about that. I have made two books. The first one in 2008 with Wayne Scotts from uh, Stone Lantern in the United States, sold out uh, after a few years and not available anymore. And then I was asked last year if I could make a reprint of it uh, for the European market, for the French market, but uh, I thought about that for 24 hours and I turned it down because I wanted to make a new book. So I went back to the people from LA Press in France and said, thank you for your offer, but uh, what do you think about if I make a new book? A totally new book, I will write it from scratch, uh, new photographs and, uh, and start all over because I think I have gained so much knowledge over the years and so much new information has been flowing that it would be a pity just to reprint something uh, from before. And the, they said, of course we will. So we ma made an agreement right away and in the February, early March, it was released at the Trophy in Belgium. And you can buy it online uh, if you follow the links at my website, if you like. 
But I'm not only doing Shohin, I'm doing middle-sized trees and the, f and the larger trees too. And uh, all of the trees are trees that stays in my collection. I have uh, so far not sell sold any trees. I have been offered money a few times, but not enough for me to wanting to sell what is dear to me. Because the trees in my garden are all of them, with a few exceptions, uh, some I have uh, grown from a very poor material, or very simple material is a better expression. And uh, that, that travel with the trees means a lot to me as a person. I like to follow them. I am just sitting right now looking at one of my very early trees that uh, have to be around 30 years old now from the very beginning, one of my very first trials. And it is as a, uh, a prunus, a, uh, a fruiting tree, a cherry tree, uh, and I cherish the cherry very much. Uh, it has been grown from a very simple cutting bought at a nursery for uh, at a garden center, cut back and uh, grown new branches, a new branch structure. And today it looks, for me, uh, it is a, a valuable piece and it looks very, very old and very mature with 30 years of growth and maybe five or six years before that. So a 35 year old Shohin bonsai just measuring around 21 centimeters from the rim of the pot to the top of the tree. That is the category of Shohin bonsai, Shohin meaning a little thing. So literally translated, a little thing a uh, tree in a pot. Uh, so Shohin Bonsai is that. And, and uh, that appreciation for the small trees have been uh, following me from the very start of Bonsai. I started a website back in 2003 uh, dealing with this, sought um, a lot of information and, and wrote blogs and uh, have written a lot of articles since then about this subject. But I'm also doing uh, all the other stuff that I love. And on my travel with bonsai, I started doing forest style bonsai last season. And uh, why wait 30 years for something I have wanted to do a long time? I don't know. It I never really fit in or I never have the courage to do it, but I have now. So I have started training some forest style trees, um, both in the medium size and in the shohan size. And Especially the Shohan size have, for, for some reason, uh, become very popular. And a lot of people write to me that they, after they saw a video on YouTube with these small, simple forest creations, they have started to do the same. And uh, that is, uh, for me, a payment enough. I'm really happy uh, that the people appreciate the inspiration I could give them from this. And the teaching of bonsai is my main drive in the world of the commercial part of bonsai. I have an educational service on my website where you can sign up and view weekly videos with tutorials that I am producing uh, ongoing. I'll just take a sip of my coffee. Of course, I have a lot of advantages, uh, have, having learned about the physiology of keeping houseplants and growing them commercially. And uh, the education gave me a lot of uh, experience, of course, and I am drawing from that when I'm growing bonsai. But bonsai is so different in many ways. There are so many things you cannot do with bonsai that I thought I could do because I was used to raise uh, plants uh, commercially in uh, quite a speed to make them cheap for the customers to buy them. So everything in the nursery is about growing things with speed and it is not about developing them aesthetically and uh, pleasing over a long time. So there's a big difference from growing a tree in a pot and the tree is not made for being grown in a pot. Of course, a house plant is neither, but the things you use for house plants to develop them as fast as you can so they are affordable and uh, they are commercially uh, attractive to grow are selected because of that. When, where uh, you can say a bonsai is selected out of aesthetically, aesthetic reasons and 
you have a quite a different a different approach to the growth of the trees. The roots of the trees do not like to be born and raised in a pot, but they are, and we have to take much more care of these trees to make them getting as old as they are. But back to my own uh, background in, in bonsai, I think my approach to bonsai in the very start was growing small trees because that was, was, was available. I found material at common ordinary garden nurseries and I brought them home and began to clip them and grow them. And because of the availability of material, it was mostly small size trees like the Shohin size. And the Shohin size began to appeal to me. I, I probably accidentally stumbled upon the phrase Shohin. Shohin means a little thing, by the way. So Shohin bonsai is a little thing, a little tree in a pot. I like the variations of trees in opposition to my career as a gardener. The, the career was short by the way, but anyway, I was growing thousands of the same plant and some of these plants I can't stand to see today because I just get fed up with them. So appealing to me was much more this variation of growing different types of trees, uh, bonsai, and with the show size it's possible to grow uh, species that you are normally not growing as large trees because they will never develop the same thickness of the trunk. They will not have the same uh, volume and uh, impression as a large bonsai some mostly have to have. So they are very useful for small trees but not for large trees and that includes a lot of like the small continastas that both flowers and bear fruits in uh, the autumn and winter time. And that part appealed me as well as the way of showing them. This approach to show uh, bonsai in a group, to reflect and view a landscape feeling and this uh, seasonal approach by the fruit and flowering trees or the naked trees in winter. You have a little uh, of the same of course with the larger bonsai but that is either generalizing a little bit here but uh, that is most Conifers, uh, strong conifers, uh, powerful trunks and very beautiful foliage pads uh, surrounding dead wood and, and naked trees like uh, Japanese maples and, and other specimens that show the naked branches in winter and that is of course beautiful. But all the flowering trees and all the fruit bearing trees is mostly used for small sized bonsai. And that appealed to me and I like the variation. So in my garden I have a big variation of types of trees. And I have of course the Shohin bonsai that some of you know me from. And I have a good portion of middle sized trees and large trees. My garden is not a garden a sales garden. It is not a commercial garden where you can buy trees. Everything is on sale for the right price, so it is. But I have a uh, philosophy of not selling my trees. And there are trees I will not sell, I think, no matter how big the money is. Because the trees, for me, and that is a very personal thing, is something that there was a uh, fly <laughs> on the way into my open mouth. Sorry. Um, that is a very personal thing for me, these trees. I want to follow them on the path, on their life, together with me. And of course, when I reach a certain age, they have to be passed on to someone else. Someone has to buy them when I can't cope with them anymore. I will never lose the interest in bonsai, but of course, when age comes, you might have to diminish the collection a little. But for now, my approach to bonsai is that the trees that I grow are a personal journey. It is my trees. They are there for me and I am there for them. Commercially growing trees will be a, quite a different story and if I ever begin to do that it will be a special selection uh, set aside and not mixed with the trees that I feel something for. And the reason I feel something for my trees is because I have grown them from scratch 
we are either collected Yamadori material and Yamadori is uh, collected trees from the wild or they are collected from uh, common garden nurseries where I find something of interest or I grow them from seedlings if they are small bonsai uh, then that is in reach and I find something in the gardens there's a variety of sources where you can find something that is appealing and grow these from scratch. I have a tree just uh, put on the table in front of me and I think it might be my very first uh, bonsai, at least is, is one of the very first trees I can remember in my collection and it has stayed there all the time. It, it measures only 21 centimeters from the rim of the pot to the top of the tree and is an, a cherry tree and uh, with very small fruits and uh, I love this tree very much. It has developed from a very basic, uh, ordinary, uh, cheap <laughs> nursery stock for, from a garden center. It was just uh, chopped down to maybe 12 or 15 centimeters and then I have grown the branches from there. Today it has uh, a decent branch structure. Cherries are very difficult to make a good branch structure uh, on, by the way. Uh, but when it flowers and when it fruits, it is one of the trees that I love the most in my garden. The trunk is beginning to show these signs of age you only can achieve by growing a tree in a pot for years. And now in the background you can hear some noise. That is because I'm living on the countryside, the door is open, we have a heat wave here. It is nothing compared to people living in southern Italy or Greece, but here up in northern Europe it is around 31 degrees and that is what we call a heat wave. Uh, people in Tokyo and Kyoto may laugh about that. And coming on that subject, I would like to make a turn to some people in Japan that have influenced me a lot. None of them know it. One of them is Tomohiro Masumi from Kyoto and in Kyoto and uh, in Japan. I visited him, him the first time in 2005 and again in uh, 2011. And he has been really helpful around some of these basic uh, questions about the sizes of the trees, some uh, categories and how to display them. So we have been back and forth over time. I asked him a few questions and he has always been very friendly and polite to, to answer my questions and my visits at Kojo Ko also gave me a feeling of the importance of the shohin in the bonsai world. And Shohin Bonza have filled a lot. Uh, I have my first website in English, I published in 2003, and it was all about Shohin Bonza. Today it is a little more. I think I was uh, one of the early ones who really got getting addicted to Shohin Bonza. I still have a lot of other bonsais in my garden, medium sized and larger trees, but this variation of trees and the beauty of the seasonal changes you find in fruiting and flowering trees that belongs to this uh, expression, landscape feeling and seasonal approach you have in Shohin Bonsai has always been very appealing to me. With larger trees it's much more about styling a powerful tree or elegant tree as you see it solo in the nature where the grouping of trees with landscape feeling includes some of the trees that you are not able to develop as large a bonsai. They are not having the ability to grow these strong trunks and these powerful images as they have when they are miniaturized in the, from below 10 or up to 20 centimeters. There you can do a lot of things. It is not easy because they uh, demand a lot of technical knowledge, but there's a lot of fun things you can do with Johan bonsai. So that has always been very appealing to me. And uh, maybe my background as a gardener, commercial gardener, where we were growing thousands of the same type of, of plant, uh, fed me up with just looking at one type of plant. Maybe that's why I love this variation of trees and maybe because I'm a little bit romantic when uh, it's coming to uh, styles of art and bonsai. I like this uh, elegant trees and variation of trees you find in the show in bonsai. But that part aside, so Mohiro has uh, helped me a lot uh, around uh, some of these technical aspects and uh, 
Another person that absolutely do not know how he influenced me is uh, Tomio Yamada from uh, Psycho N in uh, Omiya. In 1999, I visited him from, for the very first time and that. You have to remember we are back in the days where the internet was just evolving and it was very difficult to get any contacts uh, outside Europe, outside Denmark, my country. So I had to write letters to different Japanese uh, nurseries that, that I uh, found information about and uh, they were never answering me. I went on and on and I tried different things, writing to the one and the other and um, many of them probably didn't know English anyway, so they just throw my papers away, my letters away, I guess. But I was able to get in contact with a uh, guy at the Omiya tourist office and he guided me and uh, accidentally his uh, father, who was a uh, professional bicyclist at the time, was uh, very interested in bonsai and he has been growing up as a child just beside Tomio Yamada, so he was knowing him well. So that was my ticket into the Garden of Saikoyo M at my aim at that time, because I am a photographer of the profession too, was to being allowed to just photograph bonsai in one of these famous places in Japan. And my access to that was this guy at the tourist office who uh, opened the doors. And uh, the story is that uh, I, I think I'm one of the first uh, outside Japan, correct me if I'm wrong, that I was the first one that was allowed at this place, at uh, the place of Tomio Yamada, who is highly respected in Japan, maybe not so well known outside Japan as many of the others, other famous bonsai artists like Kimura. But Yamata said, yes, you can, you can come and photograph in my garden. And I had an idea that I could photograph bonsai, I could uh, photograph this famous master at work and, and be there some days. But what happened was that uh, despite I was coming from the other side of the world, I got one day and that was pr pretty much actually. I was allowed in the garden in the morning around eight o'clock and I had to leave around uh, four o'clock and I think they was wondering how can he spend so much time in this garden photographing and uh, Tomio Yamada is one of the old-school uh, Types of Japanese masters. He's very strict and uh, you can uh, if you look at him You know uh, to behave <laughs> you know what to do and what not to do and I was not eating anything the full day I was just concentrating on photographing these uh, very beautiful bonsai and I was able to get a few pictures of Mr. Yamada himself. And they came with some drinks to me at the time, some water and some iced tea, because they could see I was almost dehydrating by wandering around in this beautiful surroundings, photographing bonsai uh, all day long. And um, at the time I, I was told, now you have to stop, that's enough because they don't want uh, the pictures. I had to promise not to publish the pictures anywhere, but uh, at my website, and that's it. No selling, no nothing. They are very strict about this, the commercial business. They are a bit old school, but back to what inspired me, what, what got into me at that place was that the style of bonsai, the way they were done, I was totally forgetting that I was looking at a man-made thing. I just saw a tree, of course a tree in a pot, but I just saw this tree and I forgot everything uh, around me. That was my first experience with bonsai where I really felt the love of the, the aesthetical approach and the love for the naturalness in a bonsai not these uh, sometimes early manicured trees that you see from Japanese shows, but a more natural and relaxed type of tree that is still very controlled and very refined, but you will not think about it when you see it. You will just see a tree, you will just stop, almost stop breathing and, and just take it in. And uh, that had a huge influence in my own vision of bonsai, the way I look at bonsai today comes from that one day experience in Japan back in 1999, my very first visit in Japan.
The friendly guy at the tourist office in Omiya was not only helping me with getting the contact to Mr. Tomio Yamada, he was also inviting me out. Every day at this week I was in Omiya to study trees, walking around, seeing all of the present nurseries. Uh, there has been a little bit of uh, change of who is uh, still there, but uh, the traditional and the big places have been there ever since. And he invited me one evening to his father's home and he is uh, living there, or was at that time living there with his wife. He wanted to invite me inside a private home and that is very unusual to do that in Japan simply because there is so little space and families are living close together, fathers and daughters or sons with their wives and, and children. So it is very crowded and therefore unusual to be invited in home, but he wanted to show me the rooftop of his father because he also had a collection of bonsai. And he, he has asked his father of permission to show me these bonsai, although his father was ill and hospitalized. I was up on the roof and watching a lot of different pine trees, especially black pines, red pines, and also a few white pines. That was most of the collection. The other ones I'm not sure what was or I didn't recognize. At that moment I was very young and bonsai. It was a great gesture to invite me up on this roof to show me this private collection, something you rarely see in Japan. Mostly you see in catalogs or today online, but is at big show, so you always see this very high-end, the highest quality of bonsai and you do not see or watch what the average man is doing at his home. And one of the things I did at that time I, uh, when I walked around Omiya was to walk the side streets, not just taking the obvious and the big places with the famous bonsai that you of course want to see and get your inspiration from, but also discover what is behind some of the walls at the side street. And you can walk around and hear a little cutting. It might be a Japanese garden, a small courtyard garden where a man is pruning his trees, or it can be bonsai. And in between you see a private collection over the wall or behind an open fence and get a little glimpse into what I think that most enthusiasts should be aware of that the very, very high quality we all strive for is something not uh, unreasonable because it is, but sometimes you need the money to do it. But for the average man who doesn't put a lot of money in his trees but buys nursery plants in Europe or free bonsai in Japan or whatever, it is a good idea to compare yourself to what, where you are, at what level you are, and find your pleasure in doing that instead of always only accepting the very best. And I think everybody should strive for the very best, but the access to material also have a limit, I think, and that is why I grow from a primitive material or cheap material. There is a huge pleasure in growing something beautiful out of something ordinary. That is a learning experience. We all have to find our own path of this. Nothing is right, nothing is wrong. Just do what you like to do. I'll just continue uh, the name dropping a little. If we jump in time and jump up to just a few years ago, maybe three or four years ago in uh, China, I was invited to do a demonstration. Uh, first, maybe I should t tell you that I have been uh, doing demonstrations uh, internationally uh, for years now. But this experience, uh, this special experience for me made something and that has to do with confidence, confidence in myself, in what I'm doing. I went to an event in uh, China and uh, together with uh, several artists around the world we were invited, including Kunio Kobayashi from uh, Japan. And uh, I was working just beside him. And normally I do these uh, medium-sized trees, of course a little bit larger trees and, and a lot of shohin trees, but there I was presented with a huge tree. 
a juniper of, of, of some variation. And they were very long and very tangled and in a very big pot and there came a, came a truck with them and just loaded them in. And then we could just start working on these. And I thought, oh my God, what is happening here? What am I going to do with this material? But I found my way in it and uh, I worked concentrated for the hours. We, I think we had four or five hours to do this work. I was uh, watched by Kobayashi just standing a little apart from me. And I just forgot uh, time and place and worked on this tree and, and found something in it I liked. And that is one of the keys to understanding bonsai, that is doing something you like. You have to do it for yourself, you have to do something that you like, not something that you think uh, other people will uh, react on and applaud. You have to do what is appreciated by you. That is the most important thing to do. Uh, bonsai is something personal and it should be. And, uh, Bonsai should be different and not just copied one after another. Of course, you get influenced by anything you see and more or less copy styles and uh, ways to do it, but take in the things you like and do it your own way. The big experience for me at, at that time, and uh, now we are talking about me being very experienced and have uh, done a lot of demonstrations around the world and, and nationally. I have worked a lot with bonsai, so uh, I have done it a lot, so it is not that I was totally unexperienced, but I had never had a teacher to teach me how to do it. I have never had anyone to, you could say, approve me that what you're doing here, that is the right thing to do. But after this uh, work and uh, demonstration, and I, I did notice uh, in the process that Kobayashi made some thumbs up to me on the road of this uh, work. Uh, and I thought, well, okay, so I must do something right here. <laughs> but I didn't know what he mean. And a little funny side story to the China event. I was so dedicated to the work. I was so occupied about what to do that I, when I had to do some dead wood, I, uh, I missed it and uh, instead of cutting a branch I was cutting my finger and I think within uh, three minutes a medical team arrived putting bandages on, uh, cleaned the wound and, uh, and took care of me so I was uh, not uh, dying of a bl blood uh, loss. It was not nearly uh, as... Uh, dramatic as you might think, but the, the crowd appreciated me just continuing working with the blood dripping from my finger until it was fixed. Kobayashi, he came to me afterwards a few times and told me that the naturalness and the way I have developed this style of this tree during this demonstration was something he really, really liked. And I have never experienced that a Japanese teacher like it or Sensei and the famous man like Kobayashi would uh, do that, so that was a great honor for me. And I'm not saying this so you can sit and think, okay, this guy is now bragging because a famous sponsor master told him he's good. It's not about that. It is about the confidence you need to have when you're w working with your trees. You have to have someone who knows something about this to say, okay, mate, you are on the right path, and that was what he gave me, and I appreciate his comments. He came uh, with one of his books and signed it for me as an appreciation of the work I did. So that gave me a lot of confidence in the way I do my bonsai today. People have influence on what you are doing. It can be small gestures like this, or it can be a teacher that guides you uh, the way. And uh, everybody has different styles and uh, different ways to do things. And I am a little bit of a traditionalist in some parts uh, of bonsai. My approach to bonsai is that I like... The Japanese aesthetics, and if you can hear a machine in the background, it's because I am living on the countryside and they are just harvesting these days. And the door is open, we have really hot uh, weather today, so I have to go to water the trees a third time today after making this podcast. But 
back to what I was talking about, you have to have confidence in what you're doing to, to do something a little bit different. And although I am a traditionalist, if you take it very rigidly, what a traditionalist is, I, I believe in the history of bonsai. I believe in bringing that up to today. And we have, of course, to evolve bonsai and develop new ways. I've just presented a new way of showing Shohan bonsai in one of my latest videos, and you can probably find it on Facebook too, where I uh, use different ways of displaying the trees, but with the respect of the origin, and that is very important for me, that you respect the history. That is like in arts. My wife is a artist, she is a painter, and she is using all the classic techniques she has studied for a lot of years how to paint the right way, if you could say it like that, with the right techniques, but bringing it up to a modern time, to a modern expression, but with the old techniques. And that is the same thing I'm trying to do with my bonsai, I think. I'm not sure, but that is, uh, I think I'm doing it that way, because this is a thought process. It's not something very uh, deliberate or very uh, thought through. I am just thinking about it when I'm talking right now. And uh, still being a little bit traditional in the approach because I like the traditional forms of bonsai because that was, was so appealing to me when I saw it the first time. That was why I started it. So I will not move very much away from that. But of course you can make great variations within that theme. There's a lot of things you can, you can do when you know about bonsai and aesthetics. There's a lot of different things you can do without, to be very honest, without to making it ugly, just to make it different. I think there's a path in bonsai today where it's about just making it different, to make it different, to stick out from the crowd. And uh, I'm not very interested in sticking out from the crowd unless it is for something I have done right not uh, just to present an, a tree in an ugly pot or something like that to make it extravagant, just to do it. Uh, there should be a purpose of changing things and uh, I think as a human we can learn a lot of, of uh, changing slowly. There are so much, many things in the world today that are doing uh, hastily and with speed and uh, as individuals it can be very difficult to follow uh, that speed and uh, without being uh, lost. So with bonsai you can make time stand still and that appeals to me as a human. This uh, timeless feeling and beauty that you can find in bonsai is why I love to do bonsai. This was a little about my background and my travel with bonsai up to today. I'm situated here, I'm sitting uh, looking out of the windows and I can see all my trees. I can see my uh, garden tokonoma, something I did a few years ago after I moved to here. I, I wanted a tokonoma, there was not so much space in the house. So I wanted to do an outdoor to tokonoma to enjoy my trees. And that is also one of my key points of uh, my philosophy about bonsai, you have to remember to enjoy your bonsai. Too many people are traveling fast in their lives, busy at work, we all are, busy at doing uh, things for bonsai like I'm doing myself. But you have to treat yourself, you have to take care of yourself and looking at your trees, just sitting down and looking at them. And, uh, as I maybe told before, I will not sell my trees. I might do a business one day with selling some trees, but uh, I will always have a selection of trees that will be mine and just mine. And I will not be able to sell them for any price because they have traveled with me. They mean a lot to me. I have learned a lot through these trees. I have learned about patience, about beauty, uh, about respect uh, for life. and. Uh, I'm learning uh, every day new things to these bonsai. So today my garden is situated uh, at the countryside. I am surrounded by a forest on both sides of the house. I can look over the fields. I can feel the nature just around the corner. And having this uh, gives me an immense pleasure and immense uh, concentrated, concentrated feeling of peace and uh, quietness and I need that in my life. 
I have a busy job as a photographer beside this business with the bonsai teaching and uh, that is uh, making my daily life uh, pretty noisy in between and then it is uh, fantastic to go home watering the trees with a can checking each tree individually and uh, see if everything is all right uh, pinching a little here and there and of course I'm making uh, my videos for Kisetsu and Bonsai Online where you can buy a subscription and get a new weekly video. And that's my business with Bonsai, especially at the moment where it is not possible to travel. So that is on hold at the time. I have uh, several appointments cancelled and uh, we just have to take care of each other and uh, of course it is uh, disappointing for the people who wanted to see uh, and uh, uh, watch me with my work and I would have loved to give my experience to the people attending, but that is how it is just at the moment. Hopefully we will get back to a more normal life if this is not the new normal. But remember to look at your trees like me. I'm taking a cup of coffee in between and I'm just sitting there watching the branches, the leaves, the bark, the movement, and uh, just soaking in what it is all about. And uh, with these words, I will just thank you for listening to this very first podcast. I hope you enjoyed these words. Thank you for listening.